Hello, this is Lucy Fisher for Times Radio. We're joined today by Imran Khan, the former Prime Minister of Pakistan and the country's leading opposition politician. It's been a tempestuous year for the cricket star turned politician, who was removed from power last April following a vote of no confidence, then survived being shot in a shocking assassination attempt last November. He's now facing around 80 charges, including allegations of terrorism and corruption, which he says are a part of a plot by the government to prevent him from returning to power in elections this autumn. In recent weeks, a warrant for his arrest has been issued and rescinded, and thousands of his supporters have turned out on the streets in Islamabad, Lahore, Karachi and Peshawar, among other cities in Pakistan, leading to violent clashes with the police. Mr Khan, thanks for joining Times Radio today. My pleasure. So earlier this week, you addressed your first rally since you were shot four times in the leg last autumn, but you spoke to the crowd from a bulletproof box. You believe your life is still in danger? Well, yes, Lucy, not do I believe so. The interior minister, he has gone public to say that my life is in danger. Uh, but he says it's from some foreign uh, elements. But I know that it is from uh, actually the government itself. The, there were three main people in the government who were responsible, uh, I believe were responsible for my assassination attempt. I predicted that about six weeks before the attempt took place. So they're still sitting in government. They've sabotaged the, the inquiry report because it was implicating them. And, and I think that they're more threatened than ever because they feel since my party is now overwhelmingly uh, uh, favorite to win the elections, they feel that uh, they feel more threatened and they feel that if I come back to power, then I would hold them accountable. Well, th there's a lot to uh, unpack there. If I may, just to start with, um, go back to November the 3rd last year, um, when the assassination attempt took place. Um, can you tell our listeners, um, has anyone involved in that attack been brought to justice? And how has your recovery and the recovery of um, some of your supporters gone since then? Well, you know, Lucy, there was threat to my life. Uh, and I went on public claiming that uh, that how they would tr try to assassinate me, that they would palm it off on a religious fanatic who would claim that I had uh, committed blasphemy. And how did I know that? Because three and a half years I was in power and I had obviously the intelligence agencies were working with me. So I got information from within the agencies that this is what they were planning to do. I went public and according to the script, they actually, that's exactly what they did. They bombed it off a religious fanatic who, who, who shot, uh, uh, you know, who shot at me and a lot of, uh, 12 of our people got injured. But fortunately, there was one bystander who saw him pull out the gun and just in the nick of time, he put his hand on the gun. So rather than hitting us on the top body, it, it, the, the bullets hit us on the legs. And But there were two other shooters. And this was confirmed by the... Uh, the joint investigating committee, which which uh, you know, which came up with forensics and eyewitnesses and confirmed that there were three shooters. So after that, the the powerful quarters, because there was the intelligence agency general who was involved in this, I nominated him. The interior minister, who recently again has made a statement that it's either us or you know something like about um, you know. Uh, uh, Either it was us or them or some stupid statement he's made. And then, of course, the prime minister, all of them have been involved in extrajudicial killing and there's a record about them. So these, they were still sitting in power and they sabotaged the findings of the of the uh, of the joint investigative committee. Now, since they are still in power and since my party has won 30 by elections out of 37 in the last few months, they know that we are favorites to win the elections. And therefore, my life is, you know, more at risk now because, because they are, they're petrified that I would be back in power. Well, certainly some of the language used by the interior minister describing you as an enemy and incurable um, must scare you, uh, I'm sure. 
Um, your allies have raised concerns about the di disappearance this month of a member of your social media team. Explain what you believe or, or suspect has happened to him. Well, Lucy, what's happened is that since uh, uh, you know we were uh, we were deposed from power, and that this was uh, the the person behind it was the army chief. The uh, you know as you know the establishment is all powerful with the intelligence agencies, so he was the one who who was uh, behind the plot, but he co-opted the guys who are in power right now, you know, these 12 party alliance. So since then, what they hoped was that the, my party would just sort of wither away because once a party is out of power, you know, people turn their backs on it. But for the first time in our history, something unprecedented happened. Hundreds and thousands of people came out on the 10th of April, my government was removed on the 9th, 10th of April. Hundreds and thousands of people came out on the streets. Now, when that happened, they, everyone was taken by shock, including the establishment. So rather than the popularity going down, with time, the, my popularity and my party soared to heights, which no party in Pakistan's history is as popular as uh, my party PTI is right now. Therefore, that's when this plot was hatched to have me removed. And, you know, us winning 30 out of 37 by-elections meant that my life was even more in danger as time went on because elections are due. The, the Supreme Court had asked for the provincialist elections on the 30th of April. The general elections take place in October. Now, they're all scared that in these two provincialist uh, elections on the 30th, we would win. So they're challenging in the Supreme Court right now. They're scared of elections. And so the two are related, you know, the threat to my life and elections that coming to power are all related. Well, certainly, uh, just for listeners and uh, viewers not aware, Pakistan is having a big set of elections um, this autumn. Uh, of course, uh, you may not be allowed to stand, uh, Mr. Khan, if you are convicted on some of the charges which you are currently accused. This includes corruption, the, the suggestion that you um, sold state gifts while in office and hid your assets, and more recently, uh, charges of terrorism. What's your response to these allegations? Well, you know, Lucy, let me just uh, put the record straight. There are 140 cases against me right now, which include blasphemy, which includes uh, sedition, uh, which includes 40 cases of terrorism, 40 cases. Now remember, this country has known me for 50 years. I'm the, probably the most, the longest known Pakistani and the well-known Pakistani, you know, in, in five decades. So no one believes that I have broken the law because I've never broken the law in my life. In fact, my movement is called Movement for Justice, Rule of Law. So none of all these cases, whenever they go to a trial court, I get bail because they, there's nothing in the cases. I mean, for instance, I'm accused of uh, terrorism. Now, how am I accused? My party does, some party members do um, a peaceful demonstration outside the uh, election commission. I'm sitting in another city and I'm charged with terrorism. Or we go, I go and attend a, make a court appearance and so there are a lot of followers there. We go in and come out and there are three terrorism cases. So it's so no one believes this. And whenever they, it goes to court, they get set aside. So your contention is that these are politically motivated cases brought against you? Look, Lu Lucy, never in our history has anyone had 140 cases against me. And the rate it's going, I'm soon about to score my double century. Uh, the, the problem is that you know, the cases they are slapping against me, no one believes them. Now, for instance, the, the corruption, so-called corruption case, what is it? For 70 years, the law in Pakistan is that whether it's the prime minister, the ministers or any generals, whenever they get a gift, it has to go to something what is called Tosha Khana. There, they decide the value of the gift. Then they give you an opportunity. Do you want to retain it? If you retain it in the past, it used to be 20%. Used to pay and you used to take the gift. Mm -hmm. Now, in my time, it was 50%. So, this is the law. Everything is on record. So, whenever this case goes into court, this will be again dismissed. 
So as you mentioned, um, there have been uh, protests when you have been called to court. Your supporters have been out on the streets in cities uh, across Pakistan. There have been violent clashes with the police. Uh, what's your message to your supporters now? Would you uh, urge them to eschew violence? Uh, Lucy, look, let me again, uh, let me correct the record again. My people have never indulged in violence and I'll tell you why. A party that wants elections does not want violence because violence is one thing that would delay the elections. Now we've been asking for elections. The, the government parties do not want elections. So they have been believing, blaming security. If one is lack of funds and the other is security situation for delaying the elections. Now, if we were indulging in violence, we would actually be helping the government's narrative about lack of security. So my people have all, always been told that we do not want to have any clash or any violence. Now, you, you talked about my social media active, you know, my the guy who was my advisor, Azhar Mashwani, then our social media head in the southern province of Sindh, they have both been abducted. We do not know their whereabouts. They have disappeared for, for seven days. But this is not the only situation. In the last seven months, my chief of staff was abducted. He faced custodial torture. He was stripped naked. He was tortured. He was a professor from the US, you know, who came back to help me. Then my Senator Azam Swati, this is all on media, you can Google it. He was picked up for tweeting. He made one tweet against General Bajwa. And on that tweet, they picked him up. They beat him out in front of his grandchildren first. Then they took him to another place where they again stripped him naked. They tortured him. And this is all documented. So why are the supporters worried when the police comes with an illegal? There was no arrest warrant. This was an abduction. They all came to pick me up. The supporters were worried that they were going to, I would again disappear, abducted and tortured. So this is a, and, and then they know that these are the same people who tried to kill me. Hence, you see the worry amongst my supporters. They have never attacked the police. The police attacked my house with an illegal arrest. They came to, to pick me up. And from three sides, there were rangers, there were police, there was an armored car. For 24 hours, my house was under attack. And what you saw, what you call violence, when the police attacked them with tear gas shelling and pellet guns and God knows what, this water cannon with chemicals, there was resistance. And why was there resistance? By the way, there were three times I told my supporters, look, I'm going to go and give myself up. They would not allow me to give myself up because they were all scared that they would either kill me in prison or they would just you know there are so many cases they would just keep me for months so there is no confidence in the government right now amongst my supporters but they do not go and attack the police in fact 2000 of my supporters are in jail right now our social media people have been picked up the if you look at what has happened to uh, 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 the media there's a total clamp down on media there's a blackout uh, the only reason they're going after social media because the mainstream media has blacked me out and so social media is what now they are cracking down so that I, I have no visibility at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and Mr. Khan, what happens next? As you say, uh, I'm speaking to you um, as you are in your residence in Lahore. Your supporters have been mounting this defense of you when, when the police um, have arrived um, in recent days to try and um, pick you up or speak with you. What happens next? Are you going to have to rely on your supporters indefinitely until the elections to defend you in this way? Well, look, you know, the reason why the supporters, why this whole thing happened was when the police came to pick me up, they asked them, you know, why, why have you come to pick me up? And they came up with this warrant that they wanted to produce me in court. But the law says that when I was, uh, when I gave them a, an assurance, my lawyer, give them a surety guarantee that I would appear in the court. They can't, the, the, the law is very clear. There's section 75, 76 of the law, which says if you give them an assurance guarantee, they can't pick you up. Because, and as, as it happened, I went and appeared in front of the court on, the, on, the, on that date. Okay. So they knew that this was, what they were doing was abduction. That's why there was resistance. But, you know, what do I tell my supporters? That it is in our interest that there is uh, there's no violence.
because we want elections. It is in the interest of the government which is trying to bring the security situation as an excuse to run away from the elections. Well, you certainly uh, appear to be riding a wave of public support. I note um, a poll by Gallup this month putting your approval rating at 61% uh, and that of the current Prime Minister uh, Shabazz Sharif on 36%. So looking ahead to the uh, elections this autumn, what is your prospectus for government in Pakistan? Sorry, what did you mean? What What is my... What are your key policies um, heading into the uh, elections this uh, autumn, which it looks like you could do very well based on the current polling? No, Lucy, look, we will sweep the elections and all the opinion polls uh, say that and, and, and the results yeah. of the by-elections out of 37, we swept 30, despite the establishment and the entire government machinery helping them. That's why they don't want elections. But look, what we need in Pakistan most of all, is rule of law. Look, the difference between rich and poor countries is only one. Rich countries have rule of law and the, hence prosperity and our countries are plundered by their own ruling elites because they're above law. This is the struggle, not just in Pakistan. It's in the entire developing world where you find these poor refugees trying to, you know, risking their lives to go to uh, the land of milk and honey like Europe and England. Why? Because there's rule of law. So they have level playing field. In our countries, unfortunately, the elite is above law. And this is the whole struggle going on in Pakistan. They've all ganged up against me. Twelve parties have ganged up against me. So the entire political spectrum is on one side, helped by the establishment, which also has always been above law. So this is a struggle for rule of law. And if you, do, if you have rule of law, then that is what brings prosperity because it brings investment. Our biggest asset in, uh, for Pakistan are the overseas Pakistanis, which are 10 million. And their combined GDP is more than the GDP of 220 million Pakistanis. If we can have the enabling environment for them to invest in this country, Pakistan will stand on its own feet. I mean, I'm just giving you a, a very rough idea that unless you have rule of law, you cannot have prosperity because you know, we get robbed by our own elites who siphon off money and it ends up in Western uh, capitals and in offshore accounts. And as I said, it's the problem with, you know, you look at the developing world, it's the problem, same problem everywhere. So uh, restoring rule of law is at the centre of your um, uh, policy proposals for the country. Just a quick word, uh, if I may, on um, Pakistan's fairly precarious financial situation. It is on the brink of default. How are you going to restore financial stability to the country? Well, you know, this is, uh, Lucy, the biggest challenge because we, uh, you know, we had sort of balanced our economy like most of the developing world. You know, COVID-19 hit us two years of, after three and a half years, two years was managing COVID-19 and its effects. And then uh, you know, we had the commodity super cycle. Suddenly the energy prices skyrocketed. So not just Pakistan, but most of the developing worlds suffered from balance of payments issues because when the oil price during our time was between 110 to 115 dollars per barrel, it's come down to 65 to 70 dollars. So when, when the, the prices went up, so we do had problems. But if you look at the economic survey of Pakistan, a year ago, we had the best economic indicators in 17 years of Pakistan's economic history. And so we had managed to balance this. We got our country out of COVID-19, uh, uh, one of the top three three countries that managed the, 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 uh, uh, the, the virus, the corona effects of COVID-19, the best. We were rated as one of the best countries. And then we managed to pick up our economy. Now, we... When they pulled the plug, you know, we had overshot all our targets that we had set, whether it was revenue collection, it was exports, it was remittances, uh, it was our agriculture and industrial output. So we were doing our best. But what happened was that after that, the new government came in, did not have a plan, markets lost confidence, political instability, because no one knew how, because the government maximum would have lasted for one and a half years. The elections were this autumn anyway. So 
and in that political instability and then total in then incompetence to handle the economic situation and give a roadmap that's when we just the economy went into a tailspin so we lost 35% of the value of our currency in in, in 10 months yeah, well, a lot to, to a lot to sort out on, on that front um, uh, on the financial situation, um, Mr. Khan. Just a final word then uh, about um, cricket and where cricket perhaps meets uh, politics to bring your your former life and your current life together, if I may. Uh, tomorrow, the biggest franchise tournament in world cricket returns uh, when the 16th edition of the Indian Premier League gets underway. India has banned Pakistani players from taking part since the Mumbai terror attacks in 2008, and there's no sign of that ban being lifted. Um, the Board of Control for Cricket in India has long been accused of using this ban as a political weapon. My question to you is, would you call on other crit- cricketing nations like England to push for Pakistani players to be allowed to play next year? Well, you know, it, it is unfortunate the relationship between Pakistan and India. Uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, arrogance in the way India now behaves in the cricketing world as a cricketing superpower. And, and, and because of their ability to generate a lot of funds, a lot more than any other country, I think they almost dictate now, you know, as a sort of the arrogance of a superpower of, you know, who they should play and who they shouldn't. and, and um, I find it strange that the, that the Indian Cricket Board would take it out on the Pakistan cricket players. It's just reeks of arrogance. Uh, but Pakistan has now very good quality uh, Super League too. And, you know, foreign players come to Pakistan. And, and, and I think that, you know, why if India doesn't allow Pakistan players, so be it. Pakistan should, you know, we have excellent uh, a clutch of young cricketers coming up and so we shouldn't worry about it and of course uh, you know back in the day you used to play uh, for sussex and i believe uh, for, for worcestershire have you um uh, by chance caught uh, the current uh, racism scandal that has beset english cricket look i you know i haven't had much time to uh, watch cricket to follow that my life has sort of you know uh, hasn't given me the spare time in the last four years. But I, 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 I read about the Yorkshire racism scandal. And look, uh, from the time I started, and I'm, I, you know, I started in 1971 as a, as a teenager. And from that time to when I, when I was finishing cricket in the sort of mid 80s, I saw a transition, a change take place in England. There was a lot of open racism in English cricket and county cricket when I started. And by the end of my career, somehow, you know, if there was racism, it went undercover. You did not have overt racism by the time I finished in in the sort of mid to late 80s. But when I started off, I mean, there were all the time racist remarks on the cricket field. Uh, It was, you know, even the Pakistanis, especially in the north of England, would suffer racism. There were the skinheads who were very, you know, anyone was a Paki and yeah, they would abuse you in the streets. So it gra- gradually began to change. And, you know, by the time I finished, there was much less racism. Well, I- I'm glad to hear it diminished during your time uh, playing cricket. Uh, clearly, it seems from the latest scandal, there is still some way to go. But thank you uh, for commenting on that. That's all we've got time for today. Uh, Imran Khan, former Prime Minister of Pakistan and cricketing at Star, thank you so much for joining Times Radio. My, my pleasure, Lucy. Thank you.